It is an expression of faith. And one thing is for certain, you cannot express something that you don't have. This ordinance that Jesus gives to us is a particularly special and moving ordinance for us because it is a dramatization of our life with Jesus. As we feed upon the bread and the the wine or the juice, then we are symbolically feeding upon Christ. And that serves to teach us and remind us of our ongoing life with Jesus. And so as we talked about that ordinance that's given to us in the supper, we said that there's one other ordinance that's given to the church, and that is the ordinance of baptism. So today is a perfect opportunity for us to pause through Paul's letter to the Philippians and open our Bibles and see what our Bibles are going to tell us about this ordinance of baptism. Baptism is the most beautiful, significant, and meaningful thing that the church on earth can do. There is nothing that surpasses baptism in its symbolic meaning and in its preciousness to the life of a believer than this ordinance that we call baptism. So we are privileged this morning to do, to take part in what is the most beautiful thing that is part of the life of the church here on earth, and that is baptism. We're fortunate to to pause and be part of that, but also to open God's word and to see the beautiful meaning that is given to us in this ordinance of baptism. Martin Luther, the great reformer, was known to say that the, that no believer has any greater comfort than baptism. It is the greatest comfort that we as believers have. It was known, it was well known about Martin Luther that when he faced those particularly difficult times of temptation, those times of, of uh, duress and stress and attacks from the enemy, attacks from Satan himself, it was well known that Martin Luther would strengthen himself by repeating to himself over and over, I am baptized, I am baptized, I am baptized. He understood the significance behind it, and so therefore it was a tremendous encouragement to him to remind himself that he is baptized. So with that being said, let's take a look at our Bibles. Romans chapter 6 is where we are. Actually, I'm in Philippians 3. That's not where we are. So Romans chapter 6, we're going to be looking at verses about 3 through 7 or so. So Romans chapter 6, let's just begin by reading from verse 1 down through verse 14 to get a nice context. Beginning from verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we, to, to, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. For your members to God as instruments for righteousness, for sin we have no dominion, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Pray with me now. Heavenly Father, We thank you that we are not under law, but under grace. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus has died once for all. We thank you, Lord, that in Christ Jesus, death is behind us. We pray, Lord, that you would open the eyes of our hearts and just cause us to see with great clarity the beauty and the significance of this ordinance called baptism 
And we pray Lord, that we'd be moved in our spirits to, to love and to adore the one who created such a thing for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we begin to talk about baptism, we began by saying that it is an ordinance as the Lord's Supper is an ordinance. There's two ordinances that have been given to us. That word ordinance just comes from the word order. It just means something that we're given to do, something that we're commanded to do. And so as we think of this ordinance called baptism, what we're going to use to sort of guide us through this is not only Romans chapter 6 that I just read, particularly verses 3 through 7, but we're going to look at that, and I'm not going to preach through those verses as I normally would, but we'll sort of use that as a guide. And then we're going to use this sentence that I have at the top of your handout, the top of your notes, and we're going to let this just sort of guide our thoughts biblically to think well about this thing called baptism. It goes like this, the baptism of a believer in Jesus Christ is the obedient expression of repentance and faith by which the believer symbolically dies with Christ, is buried with Christ, and is resurrected to a new life in Christ. So that sentence is packed with meaning, intentionally so. Let's read it again, and then we'll just sort of walk through it step by step. The baptism of a believer in Jesus Christ is the obedient expression of repentance and faith by which the believer symbolically dies with Christ, is buried with Christ, and is resurrected to a new life in Christ. So just uh, one by one, let's just begin with the word expression. And let's think about expression. Uh, baptism, I like to think of it as a drama. Just as, as the Lord's Supper is a drama, so also is baptism a drama. It is the drama of salvation. The Lord's Supper is the drama of our ongoing life with Christ. And we know what a drama is. It's when people sort of act out a story and they tell a story by showing it with their actions. They act it out. In the same way, the Lord's Supper is the drama of our continued life with Christ. As we feed upon the bread and the juice, which symbolically represent his body and his blood, we are feeding upon the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. The supper points us to the cross. And so as we partake in that, we're partaking in a Christian drama, so to speak. Every time that we have the supper together, about once a month here, we are acting out how it is that the Christian lives the Christian life by feeding upon Jesus Christ, specifically the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross in our place. In a similar way, the baptismal service is a drama, but it's not a drama of our ongoing life with Christ. It is the drama of salvation. It is the drama of entering into new life with Christ. If the supper represents the continued life with Christ, then the baptism represents the introduction, the initiation into our new life with Christ. And so that's what baptism is. It is a drama that is acting out what happens to us during salvation, or at the point of salvation, or conversion, or regeneration, or new birth. It is an acting out of that. Oftentimes I think, uh, I hear Christians that, that think that baptism is a symbolic washing away of sins, and it's not. The scriptures don't teach us that baptism represents the washing away of sins. Instead, the scriptures teach us emphatically what Paul just said here, that baptism represents a dying, a being buried, in a being resurrected back to life. So here's how that works. The waters, the baptismal waters, are symbolically a place of death. We can't live under the water. If we were to go under the water, we would be dying. We'd be going into a place of death. So symbolically, as we are lowered into the water, then we are being lowered into a place of death, and we're being lowered into a tomb. So Paul says here that just as Christ has died and been buried, we are baptized into his death and into his burial. So the baptismal waters are a symbolic putting of the believer under the water into a place in which life cannot be sustained, into a tomb, if you will, and then raising the believer back out of that place of death or that tomb back, as Paul says, to walk in a new life, 
looking to our res- resurrection. And so that's the drama of, 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 the, of the baptism. We often are familiar, I think, with the words, with this ring I be with. Everybody are, is kind of familiar with those words. Those maybe are getting a little bit antiquated. Uh, antiquated, is that, did I say that right? Antiquated, there you go. Uh, so maybe they're a little bit out of date, but we still are familiar with those words, with this ring I be with. What that represents is a, a point in a covenant ceremony during which it is made known that a covenant has been made. So someone who says, with this ring I be wed, it's not like that moment they became covenantally married. But it is an expression of the ceremony that is taking place. So think of baptism in this way. In the covenant ceremony of marriage, we might say, with this ring I thee wed. Think of baptism as God saying, with this baptism I thee accept. And that is a helpful way to look at baptism. It is, it is a covenant ceremony in which God says to us, with this baptism I thee accept. It's not as though that the baptism accept itself was what saved us. It is a covenant ceremony that is acting out or showing or displaying Just like the ring that goes on the finger, it's showing something that has taken place. It's an acting out of that salvation. Now, the supper, again, is an acting out of our ongoing life with Christ. And the supper specifically takes place within the context of the church. We said when we talked about the supper that it's not appropriate for the supper to be uh, engaged in, on at least not a regular basis, in any sort of setting that's not the entire church. It's, the supper is not really meant to be a small group thing or a group of friends. There are certain times where that's appropriate, maybe a sick or shut-in person, but the supper is intended for the whole church to come together as one and participate as one. Now, let's compare that to baptism, which is not necessarily, at least not primarily, a corporate church activity. We're going to talk in a little bit about the fact that all of us, everyone who is part of the Disciples Fellowship, will have a part in the baptism service. But we'll get to that a little bit later. That's not the primary cause. That's not the primary thing that's going on. Primarily, what's going on is there is one individual, one individual in the baptismal waters. and, And the ceremony, the acting out, the drama, is all about what has happened to that individual. That individual has had God invade their heart and raised them from spiritual death to spiritual life, and has given them spiritual life in Christ Jesus. And so the baptism is an individual acting out of what God has done to that person. The one doing the baptizing, in this case me, the baptizer, I am playing the role of God. Not that I am God, of course, but I am playing out the role of God. The one in the baptismal waters is playing out the role of themselves. And we're acting out what God has done to their heart. So in the same way that the person being baptized does nothing, I often tell people that, that I'm about to baptize, we sort of have that, you know, that little conversation ahead of time, here's what you do. Basically what I say is you do nothing. You know, because sometimes you uh, think that maybe you've got to sort of help, help the person get you up out of the water or or sort of help the baptizing person out. And so we that do the baptizing, we're careful to say, no, don't do anything to help me. I'll do everything myself, right? In a meaningful way, that is what is happening. That is a display. That's a drama, an acting out of what has happened to that person. That person was dead in their sins. They were a spiritual corpse. And God acted upon their heart. And just as I will take uh, Samuel to be baptized and I will put him under the water and I will bring him out of the water. So also did God act upon our hearts to put us into Christ, therefore baptized into his death and into his resurrection to new life. It's a drama. It's an acting out of that salvific moment. So that's the first thing that we see. It's an expression, but it's an expression of something very specific. It's an expression of both faith and repentance. The New Testament emphatically and with great regularity connects together believer's baptism with both faith and repentance. Here's just a few instances. Matthew 3.11, I baptize you with water for repentance. Acts 2, 
Verse 38, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. Or Acts 8, verse 12, when they believed Philip, they were baptized, both men and women. Or Colossians 2, verse 11, 12, look closely at this one. In him, in meaning in Jesus, also you were circumcised with a circumcision not made without hands. We just talked about that, didn't we, a couple weeks ago? You were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith. Those are the two key words that Paul says there. Through faith in the powerful working of God. There's nothing magical about the water. There's nothing magical about the person doing the baptism. There's nothing magical about the ceremony. It is faith. It is an expression of faith. It is an acting out of the faith that has been the vehicle through which God has brought to you this salvation that you're acting out in the baptismal waters. Or Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27. In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So what Paul says there to the, to the Galatians is essentially this. In Paul's mind, someone who has been baptized is also someone who has faith. And someone who has faith is also someone who has been baptized. They're one and the same Two ways to describe the same person. Through faith, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So it is an expression of faith. And one thing is for certain, you cannot express something that you don't have. So it is an expression of faith that is only meant for those who have faith. And it is only meant for those who have been given the gift of repentance. Because it is an expression of repentance and faith. 